Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Exchange, the pubcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Today, we're at the ADSA uh, scientific uh, meetings, and we're here with Corwin Nelson from University of Florida. Uh, Corwin is the overall committee chair for the conference. Uh, Corwin, can you kind of give us an overview of what's taking place this week? Yeah, so we have an a overall exciting lineup, and I, as I said at the uh, opening session, this is one of the best meetings I think we'll have yet for ADSA. And I said, it's certainly not because of my efforts, it's because of all the, the science that's presented here and everybody coming together um, to make this happen and the science they've been working on and presenting here this week and all the discussions that we have um, taking place during this time. And so that, that's what makes it such a great meeting. So from what I've heard, we have close to 1,700 registrations um, for the meeting, so a great, great attendance. That How does that compare? Uh, so we, it, based on previous numbers, or certainly back above what we had pre-COVID okay. era, um, and so I think this would be the most since ADSA has been meeting alone as a standalone uh, okay. a, a society. Wow. So. Yeah, you talk about standalone. Any chances of getting back with ASS? And I I sure hope so. Um, there's I know there's a lot of people that want it to happen, including myself. Um, that it, it'd be great for that to happen. Yeah. We'll. There's people working on it to make it happen, so yeah. hopefully, hopefully we do get there. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about um, how many papers uh, were presented this week. Yeah. So one of the things I have to, to first of all give thanks to is all the section committee chairs that and, and committees that reviewed all the abstracts that were submitted okay. back in February. Over 1,300 abstracts submitted for this meeting. Um, and of those, uh, 1,200, 1,254. Uh, accepted abstracts that we had uh, to be presented here. So wow. that, again, that's like our numbers. This is the most that we've had since uh, ADSA has been meeting as a standalone uh, society. So wow. back above what we had prior to COVID and uh, been doing quite well. Yeah, excellent. Uh, you know, one of the other reasons we wanted to have you here is that you were also the uh, organizer of the student contest uh, last year. I yep. want to talk a little bit about that. Kind of give us an overview of um, the mechanics of that contest. How many participants did you have? Uh, the judging uh, aspect of it. Can you kind of enlighten right. us there? Yeah, so it's something that we we did a little bit new this year that we, we didn't last year or, or we didn't do well at it last year. Um, so all the, the students, that, for at least the, the oral competition um, that uh, entered into that, they also presented their work as part of the general session. So it gave them, so all the oral competitions were done uh, online uh, prior to the meeting. So that was the same, but they also all had the opportunity uh, to present during the general session at the same time. So in the, the master's and, and PhD categories, there's a, approximately 12 to 13 contestants in each one. Okay, ah. I was hoping there'd be more. I just... Yeah, we, we uh, there, there are some limitations in how many we can have enter into it just for, for time constraints. So um, it, it's, there's, there's some flexibility there, but around a, a 12 to 13, somewhere in there is the number that we can uh, generally handle quite well with the number of uh, entrants into the competitions yeah. for the for the oral competitions. Yeah. Now you were a judge last year. Yes. Yeah. As you were Carrie, I should have said we've got uh, Carrie Estes with us here, and you judged the posters this year. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And last year, were you judging presentations? You remember? Yes, I judged oral presentations last so year. So, what is it you look for in a good oral presentation? One, the, the, the students are quite knowledgeable about what they're, they're talking on. They're, they're, it's well rehearsed and it, it helps when they can do a, a, they'll have a recorded one and then they have kind of a shortened condensed one that they'll give to the judges. So they've had time to practice it. Yeah. Um, so that, the ability to, to really engage with the judges to yeah. answer questions. And I, I really look for the, the soundness of their science, the, the science that they have too. That To me, that's a big okay. thing is, yeah, you can do a great job of presentation, but yeah, does it sound science? And that's that's another one that I look for as yeah. a judge. All right, cool. And Carrie, what about posters? Um, what do you look for there? I'd say all the same things that Corwin said, okay. but I also look at the poster, right? That's a big piece of it. Um, I, I like the aesthetics as well. Is it laid out very easily? Can you follow it yourself if you were there alone? Um, 
and the enthusiasm of the students for sure. Yeah. Can, they, can they sell me their research? Yeah. So now I know that we've already interviewed uh, the two posters winners uh, and you uh, saw both of those, I'm assuming. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And, and tell me, what'd you like about those? What stood out? Both of those, definitely the rigor of the research, for sure. For me personally, their posters were on point, uh, just how they were laid out and uh, just how they looked. And uh, they both had a very high level of passion and enthusiasm for the research. Yeah. Good deal. Clay, I forgot to introduce you. Actually, I didn't forget. I just haven't gotten around to you it. You just yet. neglected. <laughs> yeah. right. So any thoughts or, or, or comments uh, before we uh, wrap this up? No, I mean, the the uh, I, I looked through the posters and they were uh, yeah, they were outstanding. So the, I know there were a lot of really good ones in the competition. So, yeah, it's been a been a pleasure to to be able to see these. Yeah, I forgot to highlight that the number 694 posters this year. Wow. So and that's a record, is it? I I'm, I think it would. It, I know it's the most that we've had in the last uh, five, uh, uh, seven years, I guess. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a good number. Yeah. Excellent. A lot to look at. I enjoy looking at the posters. Well, we've had a lot of activity back here, right? People yeah. looking at the posters. So that's, that's great. You know, Corwin, there are a lot of benefits to uh, being a participant in these co uh, competitions. Can you kind of expound on what those benefits might be and how that might uh, help the students in the future? Yeah, I think one of that, Carrie touched on a little bit earlier, is selling their research. And, and for students to recognize the implications of their research and be able to communicate that research. And, and th this gives them the experience to do so, it hone those skills and saying, yeah, here are the, the key elements of my research. There's a lot of things that they have in there, but to identify, here's the key elements, yeah, here's the bottom line, here are the implications from that. So it, it gives them that experience to do that, and they learn a lot from it. Yeah, uh, great comment. So Clay, Corwin, Carey, thank you for joining us today, and uh, we'll see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange. Tonight's PubCast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk, reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. Visit Balchem.com to learn more. We're here with the 2023 ADSA PhD presentation winner. Uh, Ursula, congratulations for the second time. And I say the second time because you were here last year. You were also the master's presentation winner. Uh, so congratulations for both wins. Unfortunately, next year you won't be here because what? They retire yes. after you win twice or is it just once for the PhD? It's yeah. once for You're the PhD. You're not gonna be able to be back with us again. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, Ursula? Thank you so much, Scott. It's my pleasure to be here again this year. Um, I'm a third year PhD candidate in Dr. Contreras' lab at Michigan State University. Um, my research focuses on the effect of oleic acid on adipose me tissue metabolism, especially during the postpartum period in dairy cows. Would you mind introducing your, your advisor? I have an amazing mentor, <laughs> and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him, Andres Contreras. Uh, that's very nice. Uh, Andreas. Tell us what about what 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 makes Ursula special? What makes her a two-time winner? Well, she she really can handle manage audiences. She adapts to the background of the audiences and she connects with the audiences. So she she's a great speaker. Always has been ever since she was in an undergrad in the animal science program at MSU too. Mm, awesome. Ursula, tell us a little bit about the uh, uh, presentation you gave and the research that was behind it. For this year's um, project, um, I worked with fat cells, adipocytes. So we extracted fat cells from the subcutaneous um, adipose tissue from Holstein cows and supplemented them with oleic acid and palmitic acid and then a combination mixture of both palmitic and oleic acid to kind of resemble um, fatty acid supplements already found um, commercially. And we wanted to look at the effect of these fatty acids on lipid accumulation and also mitochondrial function. 
And we saw the oleic acid and the combination of palmitic to oleic acid increased my, um, lipid accumulation in these cells, and it also improved mitochondrial function. Now, interestingly, palmitic acid alone um, decreased mitochondrial function, um, but when it was combined with ole oleic acid, that effect was attenuated. Mm, interesting. Clay, do you have any uh, exceptionally tough questions for <laughs> Ursula? <laughs> I don't know about that, but... It's all right. I'm used to it from last year. <laughs> so, Ursula, what, so what, are the, what are the implications of your research to a nutritionist or dairy producer? So we're trying to look at more mechanistically what's happening at the adipose tissue and adipocyte level. We've seen that supplementing oleic acid with palmitic acid, especially postpartum, these cows don't lose a lot of body weights. So we're trying to see what is happening at the adipose tissue level, um, which that's what we found an increase in lipid accumulation and more enhanced mitochondrial function. And probably in the future, we'll look more into maybe if there are other byproducts or um, products of oleic acid that would be more potent for supplementing um, the cows. So are, are adipocytes adipocytes? Does it matter where you harvest these from? Yes. Um, so we harvested them from the subcutaneous um, depot. Um, there are other depots, especially visceral fat, so mental, mesenteric, peritoneal, I don't know how to pronounce that. Retroperitoneal. Retroperitoneal. I can't and, say that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, their immune function is different. Um, their inflammatory function is different. Um, but we haven't really looked at that or the effect of oleic acid on other depots. I'm curious if there's a genetic uh, uh, element to this. Would you anticipate that beef cattle um, or maybe even other breeds of dairy cattle, would their adipocytes um, behave the same way? Well, in beef cattle, we have selected uh, you know, the breeds to, uh, to be able to accumulate more intermuscular uh, fat, which those are the adipocytes that are located with, between the fibers in the fat. So we have selected those for marbling for years already. Uh, probably the visceral fat, they might accumulate less, the beef breeds, compared to the dairy cows, uh, because we have selected again for, you know, more shallow trunks, more shallow body in bodies in the beef breeds than compared to the dairy cows. We always want those open rib cows, and usually when you have more space, there will be more fat, because fat is kind of filling up the spaces. Uh, so th those were really the differences depending on the type of animal, the breed and the purpose, if it's a dairy or a beef type of animal. Yeah, makes sense. Clay, anything else? No. All right. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, excellent. Two-time winner. What, Thank what's, you so uh, much. What's your future look like? Where do you plan on, uh, what do you plan on doing once you graduate? Um, I still have a couple years for until I graduate, but I'm leaning more towards industry and doing research within the industry. Uh, I love academia and I've really enjoyed my time in academia, um, but I think I have a lot of potential and a lot of opportunities um, in the research industry, especially the dairy industry. Would 100% agree. And once you, when you get your resume updated, please forward that to Dr. Claser. That's right. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Congratulations again. Welcome back. We're here with the uh, Masters poster winner, Corinne Gamarillo, and her advisor, Ben Enger. Uh, so congratulations, first of all, Corinne. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Ben. Ben, what makes Corinne special? What? Oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a good question. One of the things that Corey is really exceptional about is just her can-do attitude and her infectious enthusiasm for things. It's, it's a beacon that shines pretty bright in the lab and, um, you know, just us talking here, you've probably seen that bubbly personality. Um, it's important to have that when it comes to doing research and being able to get over the bumps and hills, which there's been a lot of in her project. So um, most people would be deterred by 
unexpected results that deviate from everything and she seemed to thrive there so mm. that's that's pretty unique in a grad student that i'd say yeah um so especially a master's student yeah great answer corinne i'm gonna turn the tables tell okay. us about ben what, what do you appreciate about him i would say dr angers taught me a lot about passion and how it shines through your work i think he really cares about what he does you can tell that he thinks about it all the time yeah and I think he cares about his students as well. Yeah, 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 he does. And it's just been such an inspiration to be studying under him wow. and to see how that carries through his work and his success. Yeah. Yeah. Nice comments. Appreciate that. Uh, why don't you tell us about your poster and what made it special? Hmm. Well, I would say the methods that we used were pretty unique. We used formalin fixed staph aureus. So dead bacteria, and we were able to elicit an immune response of um, an utter half. And we used a split utter design model too. So we were comparing between inflammation in the same cow, but the other other half just had saline. It was just a really unique model because we were able to measure metabolism changes and changes in the gland locally. Okay. And it was all about mammary gland metabolism. And I think, I think the model that we used was really cut out to be able to measure that well. So Corey, what was the question you were really trying to answer with some of this? So you, you said you had a, a split utter design and you're, you infused Staph aureus uh, that was killed. But I mean, what's your general overall picture of what you're trying to get at? So you're looking at some instances of potentially mammary gland metabolism, but I mean, why is that important? What's the bigger picture that you've been fussing with for probably almost a year and a half having experiment after experiment? What, what's that general topic that we've been looking at? I would say simply, why does mastitis decrease milk yield and alter milk components? But going further into the research, I would say, how does mastitis affect blood substrate utilization in the mammary gland during mastitis? So did you see a reduction in milk yield? No. In this? No. We didn't. No. We didn't. But we saw changes in lactose and protein and lactate in our milk samples. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Is that typical with mastitis to see those changes in the milk component? Yeah, you would expect to see decreased lactose, um, decreased protein in general, like long term, I guess you could say. We were looking at the initial response, so we saw an increase, but um, also changes in fat. But it, yeah, we didn't see the changes in milk yield. We were really trying to get there too, but. That was, that was one of the challenges of going, hey, we want to look at this. Let's, let's start developing a system where we can elicit a milk yield response. And it never materialized. And like I said, those, those hurdles of unexpected results, that, that would defeat a lot of people and going, wait, we had somatic cell counts go up to 3 million and no milk yield response. That, that was very, very hard for us to wrap our head around it and it's it's been fun to work through that yeah. question and problem with Corey. Yeah. So what are the next steps with the research? Oh, get more money to keep going. Um, what we're trying to do is kind of build on this and start looking at that immediate response, which is what Corey did, where we're looking at, um, you know, the initial infiltration and recruitment of all those immune cells and how does the mammary gland cope and adapt to have that flexibility to maintain milk yield and then see if we can finally get there with a milk yield reduction and when that milk yield reduction results where did those substrates that would have normally gone to milk synthesis where did they go um, you know that that question of um, immune cell competition it's not a new thing but I really think it has a tremendous amount of pertinence to why we see that milk yield loss. You know, those immune cells, they're pretty glycolytic. Well, what's the biggest driver of milk volume? Lactose. That's all glucose. So, so, so how, how much did lactose percentage change in these cows? Do you remember? About three tenths of a percent. And, say, and yeah. it was a little less than we were anticipating, but the, the important thing to realize here is it's a sterile bolus. If we put E. coli in there, it dropped like mad, partially because the E. coli are chewing up the lactose. And so that, that was a big deal for this study. So Corinne, you're a master's student now. Uh, what's your plans after graduation? I'm going to get my PhD 
at the University of Calgary with Dr. Dubuck. Oh, excellent. Yeah, but I'm not staying with mastitis. I'm going to be looking at feet now, digital feet. dermatitis, yeah, and genetics. So I'm, I'm switching it up a little bit, <laughs> but staying with the dairy cows, so. Yeah, well, good for you. You know, I uh, unfortunately did not announce at the beginning of this that you are from The Ohio State University, so I had to get that back in there. And so we, uh, we wish the best for you. Good luck, and uh, thank you for joining thank us today. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Right, thanks, Ben. Thanks. Thank you. So we're here now with Richard Lobo. Richard is the winner of the PhD poster contest. Congratulations, Richard. Thank you. So Richard, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your poster uh, content and, and implications for the industry. Yeah, sure. So the poster that I was presenting yesterday uh, was using trying to replace soybean meal with algae. So we use two different algae species, uh, chlorella and spirulina. And then this was a follow-up experiment from a uh, batch culture experiment that we did. So we evaluated uh, different uh, diets and levels of, of replacement. We saw that replacing 100% of soybean meal maybe is not a good idea because it could uh, reduce the ruminal fermentation. Then for this follow-up experiment, we started uh, doing a, a dual flow continuous culture uh, fermenter trial <clears throat> using 50% of uh, replacement. Usually most of the experiments done with algae, they use algae as a supplement. In this case, we are trying to use as an ingredient, as a replacement for soybean meal. So it was a great amount of uh, the algae that we used. So we saw some of the main takeaways from the experiment is that um, the, the, the fruminal fermentation can vary according to the algae species that we are using in the diet. And uh, in this specific case, chlorella was better comparing to spirulina, just because uh, we could reduce the amount of protein that was degraded in the rumen during ruminal fermentation, which would improve the nitrogen metabolism of the, uh, of the ruminal fermentation. However, we still have to do a follow-up experiment because we don't know yet if that protein that was not degraded in the rumen is going to actually be degraded later on on the abomazon and be absorbed. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're still in the process for um, for understanding better how to use the those protein sources on the diet of dairy cows. Mm, okay. So how does the how does the um, the protein degradation of the two algae species compare to soybean meal? So actually it was not different. It was kind of like similar the protein degradation. Just when we compared the two algae species, chlorella was lower. Okay. Do you know, does the amino acid profile differ between those algae species and soybean meal? They differ a little bit, but um, algae source, they are a lot used on human nutrition. There is not a lot of uh, research on uh, amino acid profile on algae for dairy. But for human nutrition, it's a good source of, uh, of uh, um, essential amino acids. So for dairy, it should be kind of the same. There is a lot of uh, essential amino acids that, that, we, that the animals need in there. And then maybe the reduction on the degradation of those uh, protein in the rumen could be good because then those essential amino acids are going to reach the abomazo and maybe be absorbed later on. How does the protein content of the, the algae species compare to soybean meal? All right, so soybean meal is around like 45 or something like that. Those algae that we are using, they were between uh, 60 and 70. So it's a little bit higher. So it's a really, because it's a cell pretty much, right? So they have a higher content of protein. In this case of, in the case of this experiment, we did uh, using the lipidated uh, algae sources just to avoid any kind of uh, um, lipid interaction with proteins or effects of the lipids in the, in the experiment. Because we're, since we were looking at the protein content, we preferred to avoid any kind of confounding effects with lipids. So what, what would the lipid content of the algae be if it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't the oil? All right, it depends on the algae source, but it could 
reach up to 15 or almost 20 percent of the of the algae content biomass yeah actually there are some uh, algae productions that they use for um, uh, production of oil for extraction of oil so yeah it's a great amount Richard there were a lot of participants in the in the poster contest uh, what was it about your uh, poster your presentation your research that allowed you to stand out and be the champion Mm. All right, that's a, a hard question to answer. Um, I don't know. Um, I think I had a good interaction with the with the judges and with people in there. So the poster was like with a lot of people all the time. And then the judge, when they come, they asked a lot of questions and I think I answered well. So I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Uh, that would have been my guess. I think you're very <laughs> articulate. You have a very good way of explaining uh, your you. research. Uh, and I was kind of curious, is there, is there any design elements of a poster that, that would stand out? Any advice you'd give for uh, next year's participants? Mm -hmm. I think like use of uh, images and figures that could be really helpful. Yeah. Um, like use like glass, um, you know, tax and those kind of things. Because I think whenever you have like uh, figures, it's more interactive, so you can show the 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 your results and everything and your design. I think figures are a really good strategy to interact with people. And at least for me, I'm a visual person, so I really enjoy like seeing and un I understand better whenever I see a, like a picture or something. Yeah, yeah, very well said. Uh, so, Richard, what, what's the future look like for you? What what are your future plans? All right, so. I'm graduating like on summer and defending my PhD like in two weeks. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I'm applying for some jobs in the industry right now. So yeah, I'm looking forward to, to join the industry force on dairy science. Yeah, awesome. Well, listen, I, if I were you, I'd give your resume to this uh, gentleman right <laughs> over here. We're always looking for talented young people and you certainly fit the bill. Thank so you. congratulations on your win today and uh, best of luck for you in the future. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Tonight's last call question is brought to you by Niasure Precision Release Niacin. Niacin is a proven vasodilator for heat stress reduction and a powerful antilipolytic agent for lowering high blood NEFA in transition cows. Protected with Balchem's proprietary encapsulation technology, you can be sure it is being delivered where and when your cows need it. Learn more at balchem.com slash Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with uh, Luke Chin and Connor McCabe. They're the president and vice president of GSD here at the uh, uh, ADSA this year. I'd like to start off with you, Luke. Kind of give us a background. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're from Cornell University, but tell us a little bit about yourself and your role as president of the GSD. Sure. Um, currently, I'm a PhD candidate at Cornell University. My work has been focused on uh, developing predictive models for dairy spoilage, particularly in cheese and food and milk. So using our models, dairy processors can predict, for example, how much percentage of the milk will be spoiled at the end of shelf life. And the good thing about this type of model is that you, people can use it to test off different intervention strategies to see what effect it can bring to reduce the spoilage. Huh? And I've been joining GSD since, uh, two years ago when I became a vice president. Now, um, now my role with the president is mostly oversees all the uh, events we are going to plan for the annual meeting as well as different activities throughout the year. Yeah, and so what, what are some of those events that you have here at the, at the conference itself? Uh, we already had our social mixers on Sunday, in which we have uh, trivia planned for this at this brewery. Uh, I also organized this uh, entrepreneurship workshop yesterday. Okay. Uh, we invited four speakers, and they from different uh, uh, dairy companies, and but they are uh, entrepreneurs uh, at the executive level, but they are at different level of the different. Their companies are different at different stages of their career. Oh, oh. Yeah, so our students can learn uh, to outside the lab what skills they need to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. yeah, cool. 
So, Connor, this is your second time on the podcast. You were here last year as uh, vice president, soon to be president, and uh, going to be passing that baton sometime tomorrow, I, I, I hear. Uh, before we get started, I want you to give a little bit of background on yourself, but before you do, can you tell us what GSD stands for and kind of their greater role uh, here at the ADSA? Absolutely. So, the GSD stands for Graduate Student Division, um, so we're the graduate student portion of the meeting, you know, we have about 1,600 people here attending ADSA as a whole, but 450, 500 of those participants are graduate students. And graduate students, of course, are the ones who are all doing the work, putting in the hours, being at the farm, being in the lab over the weekends, and helping further and advance their science along the way. And we know that scientific presentation is a big piece and big important reason for students to come here towards the meeting. But, you know, there's equal benefit and opportunity through networking, career development, professional pieces and such throughout the year that we look to be part of the GSD and help include and improve the student experience here at the meeting. So it's not just coming here for, to present science, but you're also meeting your fellow scientists who are gonna be leading the dairy industry, coming after here, future academics and the future members of the industry. Connor, I've known you for a couple of years. I, I know your background. Would you mind sharing though with, the, uh, with our audience uh, a little bit about who Connor is and, and what Connor's all about? No, oh, certainly. So um, Connor McCabe, a third year PhD candidate now at UC Davis. I work with Dr. Frank Mintlerner, um, so working on environmental, methane, nitrogen uh, emissions from, from dairies, what we can feed cows, change on farms to reduce those set emissions. And it's an exciting, super interesting place to be in California with a lot of stakeholders, of course, interested in our work, kind of where environmental things all start and where they're gonna percolate throughout the US, throughout the rest of the world. So extremely interesting place to be. Uh, my involvement with ADSA GSD began when I pursued my master's degree at Purdue University back in 2019 um, and then started firstly with being involved in leadership uh, last year, the 2022 meeting in, in Kansas City, where I was on uh, GSD production director, have served as vice president this last year, and then we'll continue on into president my last year, uh, this, this next year for our, for our meeting coming up uh, 2024 in West Palm Beach. Um, and that's been, been my cycle as I hopefully just have a couple years left left of uh, graduate school and, and concluding my, my educational uh, career to this point. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your role as vice president and then how is that going to change as, uh, when you become president? As vice president, so a lot of, a lot of the pieces I've been, been working on it was, was mainly committee work. So that my, my thing this past year was working on career development um, for the graduate student division. Uh, so thinking about creating webinars for students to take part in. Uh, Luke did an excellent job in helping lead some of those, put them together on the food side, um, as well as creating a um, discussion, a roundtable session that we'll have this afternoon between um, folks who are just finished out of their PhD within five, 10 years of their PhD and hopefully spread some knowledge, interest, um, advice for those graduate students looking into the job market in the next a year or so and what what they can be on from there because I think it's there's just as much benefit to learn about the greatest and newest dairy science that's happening here as well as the opportunity to learn about how how that career changes and and you start making some real money and and uh, the hours are a little bit more reasonable so um, what else there's a there's a whole bunch we don't we, we still don't know about once we cross that cross that path but um, that's that's part of the the pieces that we've been involved in and next year as president will will be more into a um, o oversight and helping coordinate pieces this, is, this first year was mainly to me to understand what what was all happening on and then next year we'll hopefully be able to take with it and run with it um, to, to put on another great meeting next yeah year. sounds good Luke I'm sure you've been a good role model for uh, Connor um, what kinds of things uh, have you have you kind of counseled him on as as uh, in preparation for becoming president next year well, I think uh, communication is key. Yeah. Uh, we have to make sure the whole committee, like the officers are in, a, in, a, in the same page for everything and always uh, keep track of the things. So have a agenda throughout the year to, to prepare. So make sure um, for all types of events, we know what time, what t deadline we are going to meet. Right. Yeah. yeah, but I think Connor already He's already doing a good job. I'm not worried about him. All right, good okay. deal. Good, good to hear, good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so Luke, what's the future uh, look like for you? What, what, what's your plans after Cornell? Um, my plan after Cornell is still Cornell. Okay. I, I'm going to stay as a postdoc uh, okay. to continuing to do the exciting research I'm currently on. Yeah. Yeah, I hope I can stay connected to GSD 
uh, and uh, we say the SA as well uh, okay. to uh, advertise my research and see what impact it can, uh, can it make. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Connor, what about you? What's the future look like for you? Uh, so I have a couple more years, of course, till I'm finished up and, and finish up at Davis. Um, I'm really interested in, you know, working with supply chains and thinking about how can we reduce the environmental impact um, of dairy livestock production to, to actually make, make change. You know, we have some really cool science happening out here, but much of that science is locked into academic or professional settings and thinking about how can we actually make that impact on farms to, to, to you know, help reduce the environmental impact of production and so that we can make, you know, great, great environmental outcomes at, at the producer level. So working, whether that's, you know, with like a retail group or an agriculture industry member, um, on that front, that, that's kind of what I'm interested in right now, but still still a couple of years to explore and see what will be available when, when I finish on up, so. Yeah, good. Clay, we've met a lot of very sharp and talented people this week. It's, 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 it's really amazing. The, uh, uh, the industry's in very good hands, but these two gentlemen are at the, they're at the top of the heap, right? And yes, so, they are. Yeah. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining us today. You've been uh, an excellent guest. I also want to thank our loyal listeners for joining us once again. I well, hope you learned something. I hope you had some fun and hope to see you next time here to Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests, so please reach out via email to anh.marketing at valchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash realscience to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.